Stephen King, The Pet Cemetery. Chapter 2, O Part 1. In Louis Creed's memory, that one moment always held a magical quality. Partly, perhaps, because it really was magical, but mostly because the rest of the evening was so wild. In the next three hours, neither peace nor magic made an appearance. Lois had stored the house keys away neatly. He was a neat and methodical man, was Louis Creed, in a small manila envelope which he had labeled Ludlow House. Keys received June 29. He had put the keys away in the Fairlane's glove compartment. He was absolutely sure of it. Now they weren't there. While he hunted for them, growing increasingly irritated, Rachel hoisted Gage onto her hip and followed Irene over to the tree in the field. He was checking under the seats for the third time when his daughter screamed and then began to cry. Lois, Rachel called. She's cut herself. Eileen had fallen from the tie swing and hit a rock with her knee. The cut was shallow, but she was screaming like someone who had just lost a leg, Lois thought, a bit ungenerously. He glanced at the house across the road, where a light burned in the living room. All right, Ellie, he said, that's enough. Those people over there will think someone's been murdered. But it hurts! Louis struggled with his temper and went silently back to the wagon. The keys were gone, but the first aid kit was still in the glove compartment. They got it and came back. When Ellie saw it, she began to scream louder than ever. No, not the stingy stuff! I don't want the stingy stuff, Daddy, no! Eileen, it's just mercurochrome and it doesn't sting. Be a girl, Rachel said. It just... No, 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 no! You want to stop that or your ass will sting, Louis said. She's tired, Lou, Rachel said quietly. Yeah, I know the feeling. Hold her leg out. Rachel put Gage down and held Aileen's leg, which Louis painted with mercurochrome in spite of her increasingly hysterical wails. Someone just came out on the porch of that house across the street, Rachel said. She picked Gage up. He had started to crawl away through the grass. Wonderful, Louis muttered. Oh, she's tired, I know. He kept the Mercura room and looked grimly at his daughter. There, and it really didn't hurt a bit. Fess up, Ellie. It does, it does hurt, it hurt. His hand itched to slap her, and he grabbed his leg hard. Did you find the keys? Rachel asked. Not yet, Louis said, snapping the first aid kit closed and getting up. I'll... Gage began to scream. He was not fussing or crying, but really screaming, writhing in Rachel's arms. What's wrong with him? Rachel cried, thrusting him almost blindly at Louis. It was, he supposed, one of the advantages of having married a doctor. You could show the kid at your husband whenever the kid seemed to be dying. Louis, what's... The baby was grabbing frantically at his neck, screaming wildly. Lois flipped him over and saw an angry white knob rising on the side of Gage's neck. And there was also something on the strap of his jumper. Something fuzzy, squirming weakly. Aileen, who had become quieter, began to scream again. B! 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 She jumped back tripped over the same protruding rock on which she had already come a cropper, sat down hard and began to cry again in mingled pain, surprise and fear. I'm going crazy, Louis thought wonderingly. We Do something, Louis! Can't you do something? Got to get the stinger out. 
a voice behind them drawled. Let's take it. Get a stinger out and put some bacon soda on it. Bump will go down. But the voice so thick with down east accent that for a moment Louis's tired, confused mind refused to translate the dialect. Got to get the sting out and put some bacon soda on it. It'll go down. He turned and saw an old man of perhaps seventy, a hale and healthy seventy, standing there on the grass. He wore weebles over a blue chambray shirt that showed his thicky folded and wrinkled neck. His face was sunburned and he was smoking an unfiltered cigarette. As Lois looked at him, the old man pinched the cigarette out between his thumb and forefinger and pocketed it neatly. He held out his hands and smiled crookedly. A smile Louis liked at once. And he was not a man who took to people. Not to tell your business, Doc, he said. And that was how Louis met Judson Crandall, the man who should have been his father.